Okay, so here we are for a little breathing lessons and exercises. We've been chatting a little bit about where we're from and what we're uh, dealing with. So if anybody wants to chime in with a little check-in right now, we can do that. Um, I'm going to, in a minute, um, mute everybody so that um, we don't have the background noise. There's 13 of us on right now. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. I met you a long time ago at a class at Ann Rojo's uh, house in Boulder. Uh-huh. Well, good. Oh, I kind of, I kind of remember that now. That's, thank you for uh, putting a context around it. Almost 10 years ago, I think. I don't know. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah, she was on last week. Um, yeah, so just like to let you know that I, um, I have two screens here. So sometimes the person in the big is talking is over to the right. So I look over to the right a little bit. And I may take some notes as well in case a question comes up. And you can put some questions in the chat box or you can raise your hand either by raising your hand or you can put a little, there's a little thing at the bottom of your screen that says I'm raising your hand and it shows up on my screen that your hand is raised, so. Okay, I'll go next. Yeah, please. My name's Devora, Devora Horn. I live in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. Hmm. Um, a dear friend, Etches, Etra Ruth gave me your contact. Mm. Um, and I, I'm recovering from COVID-19. I was tested positive and I have some breathing issues as a result, but I'm doing good. Good. Did you so, have a lot of shortness of breath and difficulty when you were doing that? Mm -hmm. I still have shortness of breath. I, in, um, unfortunately, in um, August, I developed um, bronchial asthma from a virus I I had then. I never had that before in my life. So that probably made me more vulnerable. And then in addition to that, it'll take a while for it to heal. And I'm looking for all kinds of support for healing. Mm -hmm. And I do do, um, anyone who's had asthma knows this, the breathing, you know. Nebula. Do you, uh, nebula. nebula. I do. Or inhaler or nebula. nebula. Inhaler. I've done, you know, I do it about once or twice a day. Is that a, is that a rescue inhaler or a steroid? It's a steroid. It's albuterol. Is that what it's? No, that? it's a rescue inhaler. No, no. Rescue inhaler. I'll just show airway. you how um, uneducated I am and kind of got thrown at me as restorative care. So, because my mm -hmm. doctor's too busy with really, really okay. sick people. Well, there'll be some good information in here for you for asthma for that. And if you want more, I'm available for private work because Botego really is a great method for helping to reduce those medications and not use them and also substituting using your breath as an inhaler. You can, right. you can do that, and we'll explain a little bit of that as we go along. Thank you. All right, anybody else want to chime in at the moment? I'll just introduce myself. I'm Winona. I've known you, Robert, for quite a while, and I'm just interested in learning more about <coughs> how to help ourselves. Yeah, and are the children okay? Yeah, we're all well. We had an exposure through my husband's work, but everybody has not shown any symptoms, at least. Okay, because there was a question somebody sent in earlier about how to work with children who have asthma out right now. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, anybody else? I'll chime in quickly. Um, Robert, it's Kate. Uh, I was Kate Quinn uh, many years ago when I met you. I was a student at DHA, uh, oh, just okay. Institute of Healing Arts, and you led some classes for us there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am now an acupuncturist in Washington, D.C., and uh, we are <laughs> yeah, you're trying to be an acupuncturist from home. So that's been my project for the last two weeks is right. uh, get the virtual wellness with folks. What's the atmosphere like in Washington, D.C.? I, well, it's hard to say because I'm not really out in it. You okay. know, we're all staying at home as much as possible, um, kind of under orders from the mayor not to go out unless we're getting food or medicine or taking a walk with our own families. Okay. Well, welcome. Nice to see you again. Thanks. Good to see you too. Mm -hmm. Hey, Megan. Hey, Robert. Hi. It's uh, Megan and Charlie. Hi. And Robert is my stepdad. And I'm a nurse. Uh, we live here in Seattle. Charlie has always worked from home, so that hasn't been a huge change for him. I work at one of the um, hospitals here. It's a big hospital, but we're one of the last to be hit. We have some COVID patients. I haven't um, 
had any direct contact knowingly with a COVID patient, but we're preparing for the onslaught as every hospital in the world is. So I'm really excited to be coming here to learn some tools for just my own well-being and to teach others as well. Thanks, Megan. Uh, I saw this morning King County uh, cases almost doubled last night. Wow. It went from 2,500 to four, almost almost 5,000 last night. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. I also see state is starting to slide down the chart. There's some other states that are moving up ahead of us now. I think um, Michigan is now has more cases than us. Yeah, New Jersey too just really jumped quite a bit. And Louisiana is screaming and Detroit's jumping like crazy. So it's always... What's that, Charlie? I think Massachusetts will surpass us next. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's the industrial cities that are getting hit the worst because mm -hmm. of the air pollution. So mm -hmm. I'm going to um, start with putting up some slides um, and work off the slides. So I'll get small and the slides will get big. But um, please, you know, like I said, raise your hand if you want, or I would mute everybody except me. And hi, Jude, welcome. So I don't know, Jude's not muting, but there she is now. Okay, so if you want to speak, you'll have to unmute. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Yes. Oh, so just let me know if you can see that. Can you see that? The slides? Yeah, great. All right. So, you know, this is about how we care for ourselves. So the purpose, my purpose here is to provide you with the information to strengthen your immune system, keep it strong, resilient, and healthy by breathing. My, my scope of practice, my field is about respiration and breathing. I've been a potato practitioner since 2003. I've been a movement educator since 1988, working with people with breathing through movement. And um, I was born not being able to breathe. So this has been a, um, a lifelong destiny for me to be able to teach this. So I'm not a doctor, so I'm not giving you medical advice. I'm just giving you education around breathing. And for me, it is one of the most effective tools we have to take care of ourselves. So keeping our lungs, ourselves and our lungs as safe as possible with breathing skills and breath awareness provides the nourishment and protection, keeping our bodies and systems healthy. I don't need to read this, but the thing that's important for me is when I started studying this, I really decided that breath was my, was my ally. It was an intimate relationship that I was engaged with. Um, that it's the most primary biological process that I can actually uh, get in touch with, become aware of, feel into, be connected to. So when I feel like I am in this biological process, in this sensing um, modality of being in my biology, I am connected to that particular uh, phenomenon in me and myself as a biological human being. And so I really want to transmit the fact that we can use our breathing for our well-being and make it a friend of us. It's not, it's not something to be frightened of as an asthmatic I was terribly frightened of my own breathing because I knew it meant that I could die. It still means that, but it was a little more on the edge of that. So it means us no harm and it is a behavior. And so what we're going to talk a little bit about today is how to use breath and its behavior for our well-being and to try to eliminate behaviors that don't foster the breath to be nourishing. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, plus some exercises. So susceptibility. So I wanted to bring that up. What makes being people more susceptible has to do, I'm a, the slide might be a little high, is these articles have been showing up about how air pollution can make you much more susceptible. So the places that had shown up more, especially like in China, were heavily, people couldn't see two feet in front of them for decades. And they were the ones that became most, are most susceptible. Maybe they'll think a little bit about, you know, the elderly and why the elderly are more susceptible than the young, though that's really changing right now. It's because the elderly have been breathing bad air for a really long time. 
And so their, their lungs are already more compromised from having to deal with a lifelong time of air pollution. We've been doing dealing with that for a long time. And um, so that was my think, thinking about susceptibility. And so what we're going to try to do today also is think about how do we, how do we ameliorate the effects of air pollution through our own breathing. And there are ways to do that. So this picture came across, this is somewhere in Pennsylvania. Uh, so it looks like China, but it is somewhere in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure it's one of the big cities. Horrific. I always think it's really ironic. I don't know if you all know, pay attention, but I watch a lot of movies and you know, they're always doing wide shots of cities and you know, for, for atmosphere in the background. I think, my God, why do you do that? You can't see anything. If they're all so polluted, don't you recognize that when you show those? All right, in this article, which I gave you, everybody's gonna get a copy of the slides, so you'll have these references when you get them, so you can check them out. This was an article that came through. So I took out this one little quote, um, that our ability to fight off infections um, is harder when we have air pollution. And it's been noted and it's been researched. And what's really important, and I think this is really a part for me to make my, to increase my empathy, and to increase my outrage about why we don't do something around this, which, which fuels my passion, is that 91, up until right now, 91% of the world's population does not have clean air to breathe. That's not 50%, that's 91% of the world's population are breathing unhealthy air consistently. Gotta be damaging. And 72% die from heart attack and stroke, and 18% die from respiratory. Half of that is lung disease and half of that is asthma and COPD. So 9 million people die a year. It's a bigger pandemic than uh, the coronavirus at the particular moment. The reason we don't see it that way is because it's not registered as air pollution deaths, they're registered as heart attacks and strokes and other things. So I have read some articles recently that now the doctors are seeing that people who get the virus it's affecting the heart more than the lungs for some people. So the same situation is happening here with the virus as it happens with air pollution. I'm just taking that to note for a little bit of, uh, like I said, for empathy and compassion. For me, it feels like if none of us can breathe, if some of us can't breathe, none of us can breathe. It's really a worldwide piece. And what did we see? And what did we see in just a matter of a month or two? The maps that we're showing, this is an old map, of course, but here we have China with air pollution before the virus, and here we have China with air pollution after the virus. So people in China who haven't, haven't been able to breathe for decades, who don't have the virus, now have clean air to breathe. They're breathing clean air for the first time in decades until the factories come back on. And we're seeing maps like that everywhere, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York City, cars get off the road, people get off the road, and so things are really changing. So it's an irony. And certainly the virus is attacking the respiratory system, which is really telling us that we're more, we can keep having more and more difficulty surviving on this planet from the loss of our uh, air quality, which we can't seem to do anything about except what's happening now. So this is the, this is, so right away, this is the most important thing we can do. We can learn to use our nose for breathing almost all the time. So two things to remember, three things to remember. You breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. It's a silly little statement, but it really makes the point. Pace your activity level so you can continue to breathe through your nose, including exercise. There's no reason to breathe through your mouth other than the fact that you may have a habit for it. So yesterday I added the third one, essential when you are outside. So I noticed that I was in the grocery store yesterday, a little nervous watching people, being a little cautious. And I noticed I was mouth breathing. It was like my fear level had got me up, escalated into what you would normally do in a fear response, which would be use your mouth to increase your fight or flight response and increase the flow of oxygen really quickly. So I got real conscious in the grocery store. Stay quiet, breathe through your nose, fill your respiration, be with yourself, do your grocery shopping and leave the store. So I was very surprised how that worked. Jude, go ahead and just unmute yourself, Jude. Yeah, I can do that for you, Jude. Hold, hold on. Okay. <clears throat> what about going up hills? I have a hill that I go up 
regularly or steps, like 70 some steps. Well, and this is, this, these are my models here, Jude. This is a, this is a woman on the left-hand side, Sonia Richards Ross, picking up a gold medal of running 440 meters, fastest woman in the world at that distance. And we want to be her. She has breath as an ally. She is completely in the rhythm of her breathing as the motivating force for movement. She knows how much capacity she has. She knows how much she can push it and how far she can stretch it before she is overriding her nervous system and her abilities and using the will like the woman on the right is. So what it means is just practice. It's going slower. So if you're going up the hill and you find you start to nose, your mouth breathing, you want to slow down so you can recatch your breath. So you're using your nose for breathing and work and walk, walk at that pace. Remove from yourself the idea of how fast you have to get up and just let your nose be the template for that. If you have to stop to regain your breathing, so be it. And there will be some exercises a little later that you could use along the way. Okay, right. But, and the swimmer on the right, also nose breathing while swimming. So I only say these things because it can be done. And I've worked with a lot of athletes who, and you know, in a couple of days, well, this is not bad. I actually have more capacity. All right? Yeah, thank Let you. Let me know how it goes, Jude. Okay. So here's the myth of deep breathing. I think we all really have to pay attention to. This has been around for a really long time without, you know, take a really deep breath. Blow it out through your mouth, take another deep breath, blow it out through your mouth. Very dangerous to do in terms of staying oxygenated. Every breath you breathe out through your mouth, deep, big breath you deep, breathe out through your mouth decreases your oxygen delivery by 2%. Three big breaths out through your mouth, 14% reduction in the delivery of oxygen around your, from your blood to your cells, to your mitochondria to make the energy that you need. Better to think about breathing from a deeper place within you. The deeper you place you can find in your own experience makes the breath a little less intense, a little more nourishing, with a little less effort and a little more satisfying. So why is this the myth of deep breathing? Because oxygen, over the supply of oxygen, the body of the body, carbon dioxide spreads its protective weight. Simplest way to remember this is carbon dioxide regulates and facilitates the distribution of oxygen from the red blood cells to the rest of the cells of the body. If the oxygen has been able to leave the lungs, because the lungs are staying permeable to the blood, not because you have pneumonia or something else that's blocking it, but you can fully get your blood, get your oxygen from your lungs to your blood, you need a balanced level of carbon dioxide in your system to balance the blood pH to release that oxygen so it will flow. So when you take a deep breath, you release more carbon dioxide than the body was meant to release at a particular time. So you want to stay oxygenated. Oxygenated makes the cells very happy. They don't have enough oxygen. They feel like they are starving for their major nutrient. And that starvation puts the body in a tremendous amount of stress, internal stress. It makes it very difficult to cope with any stress coming from anywhere else outside the body. So it's a simple way. If you wanted to look it up, I'm saying this to you. I don't have it written here, but the Bohr, B-O-H-R effect, written in 1904, discovered in 1904, is a primary respiratory principle, not a theory. It's a principle. It's a known fact that when oxygen... When carbon dioxide gets too low in the body, the oxygen distribution slows down. And so some of you know this. We, I'm going to give you the perfect example to make your mind switch over to this reality. If somebody is hyperventilating and is about to faint and they're going to collapse, if somebody runs up with a paper bag. They breathe in and out of that paper bag. What is happening? They are breathing in and out their own carbon dioxide. So they breathe back their own carbon dioxide puts the blood gases back in balance, and that oxygen starts to flow again. The brain gets it, and the body comes back awake, and that fainting 
um, feeling starts to go away. So some of you may have had that feeling in a lighter way where you may be over breathing a little bit and you get a little lightheaded. You're on the way. The brain can survive with 50% of its net, the oxygen that it needs to stay awake. Once it belows 50%, it'll, 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 you'll pass out. So you can return your breathing to normal. All right, so is this concept um, good in everybody? Everybody understand that? So really, it's really important to um, follow those mandates of using your nose for breathing all the time. At the end of this slideshow, which I won't go over today, but you'll receive, there's a list of 28 reasons to nose breathe. And so you'll get some more ideas about what there are. I'm going to go through a few of them in a little while. So nose breathing versus mouth breathing. So we're going to show a little bit about how to manage your anxiety and how breathing can either soothe anxiety or de-escalate anxiety as well as escalate anxiety. So we want to sit in a position that facilitates breathing. If you want to at this point, you don't have to do this, but sitting in a position where you're this way, this young child is sitting with a balloon over her head. So alignment is a really good thing. What's what way you see, what you can really see in that picture is that her spine is really aligned really well. She's sitting up straight. She's not trying to sit up straight. Just putting herself in that position puts her up straight. And with those two feet on the floor, a little more than shoulder width apart, that's called the horse rider position in Bateko. It is the position we mostly use when we're practicing the exercises to give the lungs the best chance to be able to expand down into the belly cavity and the diaphragm move. It's not collapsed, it's not being compressed by a posture that doesn't facilitate that. And the other thing that the body really likes about that is the two feet on the floor and the bum on the chair represents the exact same way that each vertebrae is stacked on each other. Each vertebrae has two feet on the side of it and a big disc on the bottom, which touched the disc up below it and the two feet above it. So you're aligning yourself with your spine, which is great because the lungs hang off the spine. So everything is free and open to be able to move. If you want to lie down or if sometime you are lying down, the picture on the right shows how you want to put your knees. If you lie flat down on your back, you lose 40% of your lung function because the, the viscera, the belly viscera, the liver, the stomach, the intestines, all move towards the diaphragm, which limit the diaphragm's movement. And so when you put your knees up, all that belly viscera will move towards your pelvis and free up the diaphragm. So just be, I mean, if you can't do that, then just put some pillows underneath you. For sleeping, the back is the worst position because you occlude the airway because the jaw and the tongue fall backward and make the airway smaller. The left side is best. So in that position, and sitting comfortably, you want to put one hand on your chest and one hand between the bottom of the rib and your belly button. So breathing through your nose, you just want to see which hand is moving first. Give you an idea whether you breathe through your, with your diaphragm or you breathe more by using your chest muscles. So as you sit there doing that, you also want, I'm interested in noticing for you to noticing some gradient of effort in breathing and really the state of your nervous system. When I say the state of your nervous system, we're measuring relaxation, ease, as opposed to feeling a little bit immobilized, a little bit of anxiety. It's just registering that. And then when you get a chance, when you feel ready, open your mouth, take a few breaths through your mouth, and watch those three things, where you breathe from in your body, state of your nervous system, and effort. And you can go back and forth until you kind of really register it.
And this would be a good time for anybody who wants to unmute themselves to report in what they may have discovered so we can see if we all are on the same page or somebody has a variation of that. Some people feel more comfortable mouth breathing. Generally, people feel more relaxed nose breathing. But let's see, any comments? I'd say uh, certainly when I started to breathe through my mouth, uh, hand, so nose, it certainly felt like my diaphragm, uh, belly hand was moving more. Mm -hmm. When I my mouth, they were even, if not a little bit more into the chest first. Great. Thanks, Megan. I, I totally agree with that. I would my mouth was shut, I would feel my diaphragm more. And when my mouth was open, I would feel my chest more. And for me, when my mouth was open, the anxiety and my heart beating faster happened so quickly. Yeah. Unbelievable. Good noticing, Sarah. Yeah. It's real, Angela? I noticed that my chest and my belly really move about the same with nostril breathing, uh -huh. or nose breathing. Sure. And when I started breathing through my mouth, I definitely felt more like it more driven from the chest. But I also was surprised at how quickly my mouth felt dry, like almost on the second breath of breathing through my mouth. It started feeling more constricted in my throat mm. with that dryness. Great, thank you. Yeah, the, the whole piece is it's a sympathetic, parasympathetic balance. Sympathetic is a fight or flight response and parasympathetic is a rest and settle response. And so if a bear were to come through your door right now, you know, the first breath you would take would be, oh, and your whole body would be on a fight or flight immediately. That's the function of it to put you in fast heart rate, get blood around a whole lot faster. Um, bring the breath to the chest because there are bigger alveoli in the chest and so you can deliver more oxygen quickly on a short-term basis and many other things including like I said the rapid heart rate so the same thing is true when we breathe through our mouth any particular time we're just activating those sympathetics just a little bit it may not throw you into full fight or flight but that little bit of anxiety you feel is also can be considered a little bit of mobilization it's another way of not taking it and putting such not such a negative connotation on it. But we're mobilizing for action. In some cases, that may be good. But generally speaking, if we're trying to stay quiet in ourselves, especially now, and easy in our bodies, we're better off staying out of activating the sympathetics. Because when we breathe through our nose, we're balancing. On the inhale, our heart rate's going to climb a little bit when we breathe in. And when we exhale, our heart rate's going to slow down just a little bit which is why the emphasis these days is on relaxing into the exhale more deeply and a little longer is to let the heart rest. Okay, good. So there's a good um, practical example of the difference between what the nose does and what the mouth does. So, um, hang on, let's, okay. So some first thing that comes up for people is, well, what if my nose is stuffed? You know, what if I can't breathe through my nose? What do I do then? You know, it doesn't feel good for sure. That's for sure. So this is the nose clearing exercise from Boteco. And the function of this exercise is to have you pause your breathing just for a little bit. Put some activity in your uh, musculature or your body. So when you're making more, when you're making more activity, you are producing more carbon dioxide because that's the byproduct of energy production from the use of oxygen. And that oxygen, that carbon dioxide can act as a vaso and bronchial dilator. It can open up the airways and it can tell that the system know that the, um, the response of creating more mucus is not needed right now, that we're actually slowing our body down and that the mucus, the mucus membranes can be withdrawn uh, through the epithelial lining of the, of the mucus membranes. So it's a really simple exercise. Um, some of you may be reading it. So you kind of get into the motion of breathing in while you lift your head and breathing out. When you lower your head, you can do that once more. You breathe in and you breathe out. And with clean hands afterwards, you pinch your nose and you bob your head six to 10 times. 
or till you feel a slight urge to breathe, a very slight urge to breathe, keeping your nose closed, mouth closed, and breathing in like you were smelling a rose. So the most gentle breath you could possibly imagine. You're in charge of the volume and the speed, so slow it way down so it feels like it's a light, thin stream of air. And if you need to repeat it to keep the nose open, then do it again and again and again until the nose opens. If you're trying to teach this to somebody and you're somebody who has an, something um, wrong with their neck, I wouldn't say wrong, but you know it's hard for them to bob, then you can just sit in place and move your feet up and down, that'll do it too, or walk back and forth. Any kind of muscle activity while you're doing that um, will help increase the uh, flow and decrease the blockage of the mucus over time. The couple of things to think about, just remember this, if you have a heart condition or something that's really uh, high blood pressure, you only wanna do it six times. If you're completely healthy, I see your question there. You only can do it if you're completely healthy, you can do it until you feel that slight urge to breathe. If when you let go, you take a really big breath because you're out of breath, you held it too long. So really measuring a slight urge. Okay, question. Devora. Devora, I, right. I, I, <laughs> Devora, I am Devora. Thank you, um, Devora. Just, just to be clear, just because I'm trying to um, embody this. So the breathing, is three to six times and then hold your nose or hold your nose in between each breath? Let me say it a couple of ways. Sorry. One is in Pateko, we always hold at the end of an exhale. Not a long <laughs> exhale, but I breathe in, breathe out. Once I breathe out that exhale, then I pinch my nose and then I bob my head. And it's especially, we do that especially for asthmatics. I mean, it, because asthmatics, long-term asthmatics have hyperinflated lungs. And so we don't want to keep them any more hyperinflated by holding their breath on the inhale. So we hold the breath on the end of the exhale. So just remember, just to, if you don't know that the dominant nostril is, for breathing changes every 20, 90 to minute, then 20 minutes to 90 minutes. So sometimes you breathe through the right nostril more dominantly than the left and vice versa. It moves around back and forth. And that's to help that's it. When we root through the right nostril, it's working with the electrical hemisphere of the left brain to tune it, to get it in balance, and it switches over and it goes to the other one. So we're back and forth all the time to help our brain stay in balance with the electrical activity. That's what the nose helps regulate. That's why people like alternate nostril breathing in yoga because it opens up both nostrils and so everybody feels coherent having both sides in tune at the same time. Okay, any questions on the nose clearing? Good exercise. I remember coming home from Sweden once with a cold. I did this every five minutes on the plane. I was, I was a brand new Bottega practitioner and I said, I was hell bent. I am not breathing through my mouth. People next to me thought I was entirely crazy. Yeah, Angela. Jed. What about a deviated septum? You know, it's a good question. It really depends how, I mean, I, I have a deviated septum. And so I'm a, I'm a nutcase around breathing. So what I notice about breathing is when I'm breathing through my no right nostril, Jed, when it's much more open than the left one, the left one's closed, I get a bigger rush of air quicker. Hmm. So I have to regulate that. And when, I'm when my other nostril is dominate, dominant, less air comes through slower. So my breathing rate has to go slower when I'm, when I'm noticing that. Hmm. Now, that I've had to have clients who've had such a bad deviated septum that they can't breathe through their nose at all. If that's the case, you need to get that fixed. Mm. Okay. But you just, you know, you kind of, I'm just sensitive to, okay, well, now I'm through my, and the other side of that is when I'm in my left brain, I hope I get this right, I'm in more of my feeling receptive body. When I'm going <laughs> through here and I'm in my right side, I'm more in my doing. So I have read yoga papers where yogis, you know, they, they here's a little tip, the, the trigger for which nostril you breathe through is under your armpit, according to the yoga people. And I had one person come to me in class and said, yes, I had a yogi master in India that carried a crutch. And depending on which nostril he wanted to breathe out of, he moved the crutch from the right to the left. So if he was in something that was more receptive, like eating, he would make sure he was, had the crutch under the right side. If he was more planting the garden, wanting to do something active, he had the crutch on the left side. Uh, go figure, but that's where it is, and that's one of the reasons why we turn over at night. 
when we're on our right side, we're breathing in the other nostril, or on our left side, we're breathing there. So our body is automatically trying to balance itself by turning you over when you're sleeping. The nose is an amazing structure. Okay. Did I answer the question, Jed? Yes, thank you. Yeah. But like to say, the person I had who had couldn't deep breathe through the nose, I mean, he, he couldn't sleep, he couldn't work, that mouth breathing just was destroying his life. And he was and he was reluctant to go to the doctor. I made him go to the doctor, he fixed it, his whole life turned around. But if any of you go to the doctor to get your noses worked on, make sure they don't um, reduce your turbinates in size. Enough said on that. Just be careful about that. Okay, so I'm trying to do this more and better when, I, when I'm when i talking to you. Uh, more and better. But one of the places that we tend to give it away when we breathe through our mouth is when we talk. So if I pace myself so that I can breathe through my nose all the time, when I feel like I run out of air, I close my mouth and I breathe back in through my nose at the end of the sentence. So I'm taking some time to feel my own breathing while I'm breathing back. And therefore I'm connected to myself and then I come back and talk to you. So I'm resting in between each breaths for a moment. Helps keep my energy calm, not escalated into anxiety when I'm talking. So hard to practice, hard to do after time. Took me a year to sort of get a hold of it. Reading aloud to yourself or reading aloud to another and using periods and commas as places as breathing breaks. It's a good way to practice. And if you really take the time to really finish the inhale before you speak again, the next sentence is like a brand new sentence. So when you're reading, if you stop, at the end of a period, it's not like you're trying to rush that next sentence. It's like, I'm starting again. So it has more emphasis and it has more continuity. And for the people who are listening, there's a break in the speaking. So you get to integrate a little bit more what I'm saying without having to feel overloaded. You're getting some rest too from the speaking. Obama was good at it. The queen is good at it. Who else was good at it? Austrians are good at it. They find mouth breathing offensive. <laughs> Go figure. So good thing to practice for yourself. All right, so here are some, uh, some major benefits of nose breathing. I particularly want, like showing this particular picture because the top picture is a real nose without the actual vestibule of the nose so that we see the turbinates, the bones in the nose. And the functions of those bones is to spiral the air. And that's what it looks like as it's entering. There's an ambulance outside. As it's entering into, um, into your lungs, right? Right at the place where it's about to go and to separate into each lung, that's what the air looks like down in there. Of course, it's a funny picture because they put smoke into the air, but this picture is about 50 years old, 60 years old. And if we go back to the woman who was exercising, she is feeling that spiral and that's how she's running in a very spiral way. And that's what causes our movement internally to be more spiralic than linear. So it's a worthwhile thing to know. Okay, so yeah, let him out. Let's see the ambulance. Uh, the nose is the guardian of the lungs. We have some really old neighbors here, so it kind of just brought me some concern. Um, so the nose is the guardian of the lungs. That's what I like to call it. I like to call it the guardian of the lungs. And what's going to, what it can do, and this is in relation to air pollution, it filters out 0.5 microns and above, which are most of the pollutants in the air. Not smoke, unfortunately, not viruses, and not nanoparticles of plastic, but most other um, particles are filtered out. A hair is 50 microns, so you can imagine the small size of it. So you're really giving your body a great chance to keep those fill, to keep those um, particles out of your lungs that they have to deal with. Wow, there's two ambulances out here. I'm sorry, I should close my window. I'm a little distracted. Hmm. Um, so it regulates the temperature of the air that comes into the lungs. The lungs only like body temperature air. So if you breathe through your nose, it's cold out. 
the, as it circles around, as the spiral movement of air goes through your sinuses and through your nose, it's picking up the blood from the, the heat from the blood if it's cold out, or it's pulling out heat out of the air into the blood. The blood is the temperature regulator of the body, so it can dump heat and it can pull out heat from the blood, from the air. It also regulates the humidity of the air, so it can add water through the mucous membranes, or it can pull out water if it's too wet for the lungs. And most importantly, it produces antibacterial molecules. So it can kill bacteria on entry into the lungs. And there is some, and I'm gonna to go to the next slide, there is some evidence that nitric oxide, which is produced by the lungs, also has antiviral um, properties. It's been, I have quotes from scientific research that shows that. We'll get to that in a little while, but nose breathing escalates the reduction of nitric oxide into the body as well as does humming. And I think here, this is my opinion and my opinion only, if we can get the virus to come into our nose before it gets into our mouth and goes directly into our lungs, perhaps the body will get a little bit more advanced warning to be able to mount some kind of defense for it. Just a particular thought of mine. Yeah, Renona. Um, what did you say about the humming? Can you say a little bit? So I'm gonna to get to that in a few moments, um, but, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, people are talking about the immune system and, you know, where it's going to raise blood cells and this production here, but I consider the immune system, our body is an immune system. All of it is working towards our betterment. You know, our skin is part of our immune system, our respiration is part of our immune system. So just think the better way, we, best way we can take care of ourselves is to be oxygenated. So this is what we're teaching here. So um, it delivers oxygen to the cells. Um, the body is fully oxygenated. It stays strong, balances the automatic nervous system, and it mouth. And we know mouth breathing delivers directly into the lungs. Just repeating myself here. So here's some of the things that I think about breathing, and why I'm interested in it so strongly is because I feel like it's a gift. It keeps my life moving from breath to breath. I try to teach treat it with honor and caring and tenderness and grace give it its due. It is my ally. It teaches me what I need to know. It answers questions for me. It seems weird, but it does, you know, if I ask it to show me something, it kind of shows me things. Breath touches us on the inside for comfort in this time of social distancing when we may not be always available for touch. Feeling the breath internally is a way of feeling and touching ourselves on the inside. And we share with all living creatures. We're all breathing the same one atmosphere, the same one breath. It's a unity for all of us. Okay. So here's the piece. Nose breathing and 20 minutes of humming increase the production and delivery of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide was discovered, I don't know, 20 to so 40 years ago. You got a Nobel Prize for it. And in past studies, many past studies, been shown to have antiviral effects. And this is one of the links. At the bottom, at the end of the slideshow, are 14 different references from PubMed about how nitric oxide has antiviral effects. And the only way you get that nitric oxide to increase in your body is for nose breathing. So we're all great at humming, aren't we? Anybody can hum? So let's take three minutes and let's hum together just for a moment, see how we feel, all right? I'll put a stopwatch on it. We'll just do three minutes of humming. You can hum any tune you like. You're on mute. And if you want us to hear your humming, you take yourself off mute. Make sure you breathe back through your nose after you finish the phrase of hum.
Okay, coming to the end of our three minutes. So just practice that 20, 20 minutes a day. Break it up. Lots of studies show that. How did that feel? How did, how did that register for anybody? Made me feel high. Uh, high on oxygen, huh? High on nitric oxide. Okay. Is that a good high? Good. A good high, but a surprising high. Mm -hmm. I saw some other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, <laughs> in the beginning, I was doing like through my mouth because right. I've been used to I've been used to that, and then I was like, "Oh, how is this breathing exercise? What am I going to do?" And then I was, "Oh no, you have to not open your my mouth." And then I found a way to just keep on my mouth closed and breathing through my nose. But I, I'm like still uh, in a wondering whether. Mm, like because I had to like stop sometimes with the humming to breathe. I couldn't just keep on for three minutes humming. No, no you have to. You know, you probably can go for five seconds or ten seconds and uh, breath, right? Yeah. Thank you for making that clarification. Yeah, that's the 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 trick is, and we're going to just spend a little more time with this. The trick really is for me when I'm doing the talking or anytime I'm breathing. If I turn my attention on my breath, not to how am I breathing, like am I breathing right or am I breathing wrong, is this good or is this bad, but I just follow the movement of my breath and the movement of my body. I get into relationship with my awareness of noticing how breath and body move together. When I feel that, I really feel like I'm connecting to myself through the portal of breath. And so when I do that, there comes a point when it's like, oh, I'm really registering myself. And then I get satisfied with that. And I feel that the breath is satisfying. And then I take, then I can start to speak again. So it's an exercise in sensing my relationship in my body of breath and body as I breathe in. So when I'm humming and I stop, I'm back with my own experience and now I'm humming again. So I take the time to breathe again so that I'm satisfied. Because if we breathe, if we hum too long also, we'll be using our residual air and run out of breath and we'll grab gas for breath. So just easy, pleasing, make it pleasurable. Aesthetics. Ju, did you want to say something? No? Okay, great. I, it was pretty interesting, my one dog is eating a bone and he totally stopped eating it when I was humming and started falling asleep. And now he is totally back to eating his bone. That, there you go. There you go. Do we need more evidence than that? Yeah, there you go. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not kidding. He literally was, he's back to eating his bone and he was falling asleep. I believe you. Now you yeah. know how to put him to sleep. So cute. I mean, who else do we hum to to put, make them go to sleep? Babies. Yeah, right. It's kind of a no-brainer, right? <laughs> More oxygen we have, the quieter we're going to be. Yeah, we don't know. Um, I guess that's why I was, when I heard you say that earlier, I was kind of keyed into it because it's something I do just for self-soothing kind of humming. And it, it just feels really good to have that sound around. Right. And if we're sensitive to it too, when we're breathing in and we're humming, we're also going to rock ourselves because we're not, even when we do breathing, you know, little explorations or meditations, it's, we're not meant to sit still. I mean, we may sit upright and quiet, but the body's being moved all the time. It's rocking itself off center and on center and back and forth. We're like a little bit of a pendulum. So allowing that, is really an important piece because then if we hold it too still then we're really limiting even the lungs to be able to open up because we're holding ourselves too tight thanks Winona. all right so Robert. did somebody say something yeah i just wanted to con um add to kind of what winona was saying i have always been a hum humming person at work <laughs> and what 
artist absolutely is that it's it is very self-soothing and there's something about the vibration as well and if i'm humming like you know higher it takes more breath whereas if i can sink into a lower tone that also the vibrations a little bit more pop you know tactile that also feels very soothing and takes less effort in my breathing as well yeah, that's great, Megan. The reason, if I could give you a reason for it, and this was um, Cymatics discovered this, Han, not Han Staley, but I can't remember the father of Cymatics, is that vibrations decrease density of tissue. So when you feel that hum in your chest, the tissue is more resilient to be able to breathe. Great, thanks for that. So breathing is a habit. We all have habits of way we use our, our breathing. One of the habits is we use our mouth for breathing some of the times. So to be able to change that habit or to notice when it is that we do that, you want to make a list of when you notice to use your mouth for breathing. Good list to make. Some of the most common places are eating, talking, taking a shower, driving a car, getting ready to go on vacation, watching television. So if you notice for yourself, when you mouth breathe, you go, oh, I'm about to do that thing again where I usually use my mouth for breathing. Now I can be a little bit more conscious and not do that. Two of my surprising places was one was I getting out of my automobile, my car. I'd be driving along really nicely with my mouth closed, breathing through my nose. I'd stop the car and open the door. And as soon as I opened the door, I started mouth breathing. The other was going to the mailbox. And I don't feel so weird about that because that's been a common complaint from clients. I always mouth breathe when I go to the mailbox. The mouth breathe, for me, the mouth breathing was the was challenging my, my control issues. That something was going to be in the mailbox that was going to upset my world. Didn't want to see it. It never happened, and I don't want to feel that way, but I learned how to soothe myself on the way to the mailbox. So make a list. Make a list for yourself. The supportive posture always helps reduce resistance, which we did. And here's some inf information too about tongue placement. So the tongue is meant to be at the roof of the mouth with the lips and teeth slightly touching and resting on each other. Not pressing together, but just resting quietly with the root, tongue at the roof of the mouth. And this completes the respiratory circuit and opens the airways in the throat and the lungs. So here we're gonna play with this. So this is a picture of the tongue up here at the roof of the mouth, right hugging the upper palate. The teeth are slightly touching, the lips are closed, and the important place to look here is at this airway right here, nice and open right here. Here it is the same picture, tongue is not at the roof of the nose or the floor of the nose roof of the mouth, it's down lower and the airway gets collapsed. Do you want to try that for yourself? Just put your tongue as best you can. If you want to feel what it feels like up at the back of your teeth, most of us who haven't had their tongue up at the roof of their mouth for their entire lives as children probably don't have enough room to put the back of the tongue between the molars. That's where it's meant to be, but you can't get it up there if you haven't done that all your life, but you can to feel it back there you want to make the sound of ack, 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 and you'll feel the back of the tongue lift up towards the back of the teeth on the ack. So you get a feel for it back there. So you want to have your tongue back up, up the roof of the mouth, teeth slightly touching or close together and the lips resting. And just notice how you're breathing. Just notice your nose breathing. Drop the tongue down Open the mouth, open, you know, leave the teeth further apart. Maybe open the mouth or leave the lips touching, but let the teeth stay apart. But drop the tongue and see if you can notice a difference between how the airway movement, as well as completing the circuit. How connected do you feel to your energy field when the tongue is at the roof of the mouth? And how much do you feel when it drops down? The way of saying it is how much more presence do you have 
when the roof, tongue is at the roof as opposed to when it drops down. Anybody want to report? Oh, Kate? So I'm actually feeling something a little paradoxical. I actually feel more relaxed than at ease when I let my tongue rest low. And there's something a little uncomfortable. I'm not pressing hard, but when I put my tongue up, there's just something about uncomfortable about having that much touch sensation or pressure on the roof of my mouth. It sort of feels like there's something there that shouldn't be. Yeah, you probably haven't been doing that most of your life. You've been having your tongue down. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So it's just getting used to it. And really, you don't want to apply pressure. You just want to let it rest there. And so more you're thinking about, it's a little conceptual, but you can get to it, is your tongue is actually supporting your brain pan. So you can relax this to rest down on this. So you can soften your eyes, soften up through here. Let that rest on your tongue. Because the tongue is going to rest here and rest on your lungs. We're stacked that way. It's interesting. I actually feel a little more, when I put my tongue up, a little more pressure up through that zygomatic than when I let my tongue. Mm -hmm. And it may just be that I'm on No, it's fine. I feel a little more pressure too. It's a presence. There's a presence there mm -hmm. that is interpreted as pressure. But the airway opens up. This is what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Anybody else noticing a change in the airway space? Thank you, Kate. For the better? Go ahead. Yeah, I feel the same as Kate, actually. That's what I experience. So maybe it's because it's new to me also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then when you, but when you were saying like not, uh, like not pushing or just more like relax the tongue so it's more light, there was a change there, but it still it feels it, I'm sensing it different than what I'm used to. <laughs> I noticed this. I noticed that it just it makes me more aware of this part of my face when my tongue is up. It's I have hard. a jaw that I have a jaw that's kind of uh, crooked. So maybe so I I I come to feel up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Jude. Wait a minute. Hold on, Jude. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's supporting the zygoma and, and the upper structures, just like you said, supporting. Did you say which part of the brain it's supporting? Well, I think it, you know, the um, it's the brain pan, the tentorium. I think, you know, everything has got right. weight to it. It's all combined anyway. So if something yeah. is underneath holding something up, you can let the weight come down. It's good, you know. It's, it's, Settles it's in. Sensory. Yeah, it's a sensory experience. Yeah. Which can feel like pressure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And make you aware of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it does take some getting used to. Do you um you haven't spoken about the, the little wrinkles behind your teeth and where the tip of the tongue should be. Right at the first wrinkle. Yeah. At the first ridge. So not pressed up against the teeth, but against that first ridge behind the first behind the upper teeth. See the tongue originally <coughs> was between the two sides of the hard palate. It was embryologically, it was sitting in between the, in, in between the hard palate. And when the mm -hmm. palate came together, the tongue dropped out. So it's almost as if it's its original resting place. We're just returning it to its original resting place. Kind of like that embryological imprint. All right, so another way to, for us to reduce the, um, the airway resistance <clears throat> And this is a way, this is, this is a way to get your body to breathe you, to get you out of the way of you breathing your body and let your lungs take over breathing you. And I think at this particular time, it's really important for letting our lungs do that. So that we're not putting extra effort, we're not putting our fear into our breathing. And so we're using an old 5,000 year old yogic tradition of two syllables, of sa and ha. And so just before we go ahead and use those two syllables, just take a look and see the kind of effort that you use, how much of your own 
energy and will do you use to bring air in through your nose? Like you are actively breathing. You're putting musculature into it. You're putting intention to it. You're putting your, your mind's eye into taking breath in. And then when you breathe in, say the syllable sa. So when I'm thinking, not, let me rephrase that. Think the syllable sa, which means you will hear it in your head. So you're not saying it, you're just thinking it. And you're thinking it through all the way through the entire inhale. And the, and the slower you think it, the slower you'll breathe. And so another way to notice the impact of this little exercise is when you're breathing with your energy pulling in through your nose, you want to track how much tension's in your chest. And when you start to use the syllable sa, what happens in your chest? For me, it feels like my chest opens to receive the air and pull it through my nose. Makes it a lot easier to breathe. And so on the exhale, which is passive, you're letting the lungs elasticity release the air from the lungs, push the air out. You want to say ha, or think ha, so you hear it. So you're putting the lungs in charge of how much air they need. And with ha, you're letting yourself maybe go a little beyond in your exhale what you're normally used to. You may find you need a bigger breath right at the beginning because you're taking more air in than you used to, but that's okay. The lungs are now in charge. Your body's breathing you. I think there's a chat that I need to look at. Okay, somebody's leaving. So how is that? Tell me what you tell me what you're experiencing. Let's see if we can parse this out. If we need to say more about it, every this has just been an exercise that I've used for years, which people find really useful, and I hope you do also. But you may have some difficulty with it or not quite understand it. So I'm really open to getting this because this is a way of really being in relationship with how your body moves with breath. Nancy, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say that um, I did this exercise with you just a couple days ago. Uh -huh. and since you just talked about holding the, the, the tongue at the root of, of the mouth, it was a really different exercise for me this time. Mm -hmm. And I, um, yeah, it was great. I mean, it, it immediately brought that breath way further down into the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, yeah, so thank you for that. That was that was a really interesting contrast between the two experiences. So more more depth this time with the tongue at the root. More depth, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, interesting that it just slowed everything down more. Fuller breath, yeah. Great. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it's good. Jude. Um, I felt the expansion and the softness in my diaphragm, but I also could feel it traveling through the. I don't know whether it was the turbinates or whatever they were that you showed us at the very beginning. I could just feel it go through that part of my respiratory system also in some way, it felt like. That's great, Jude. I want to speak to that, so I really appreciate that. That part of the habits of the way people breathe has to do with the fact of which turbinate they breathe through, lower, middle, or upper. People have habits of 
taking more air through the lower part of their nervous system, through the lower part of the nostrils, or more up in the upper, which is a smaller opening. Okay, Angela, one second, okay. Um, so also from, um, from 5,000 years of, of yoga experience playing with breath, what they have tracked over the years is that those three openings on each side of the nose correspond to three different parts of our body the, in our nervous system. The lower nostrils, the lower part, of the, at the bottom of the nostril where the lower turbinate is, when that is activated more, more intensely, it fires the reptilian brain, the brain stem. So it puts us into a, that, that angry spot so that when we, when we flare our noses, like you know, we're getting heated up, you know, like that, that's feeding that fire of the instinctual brain. The middle holes are our heart. It goes to the limbic system, to our emotional brain. The upper ones here move up into the bliss point, to the third eye, and to the frontal lobe, the, the uh, neocortex. So we have a personal habit of how we take air, and we may be missing one of those nostril openings. But sa and ha, like you're experiencing, Jude, give the air a chance to pass through all three, which means that all three are coming online and there's a balance between the heart, the reptilian and the cognitive. So rather than just being in head space or fire space, it brings in the unity of all three. And I do feel that. And I really do appreciate the feeling of that because I can tend to be heady and be, notice when I'm doing that, I'm breathing up a lot. And so when I switch it, so I'm like having my heart be part of my head. What? Excuse me, you had a name for those three, the reptilian, the what, and the Reptilian, what? the limbic, which is limbic. the emotional and the heart, and the cognitive. Also bliss. Sounds good. Kate, did you have a question? Well, I'm just really fascinated with this because I've done tons of different breath practices and this is not one I've ever done before. And it's profound in what I'm noticing in terms of how much less strain or resistance there seems to be in the muscles of my chest to get, seems like there's less strain, but a, a better, fuller breath. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really curious, I know you just spoke a little to the, the, the turbinates, but the mechanism of this, you know, what is it about thinking those syllables that enables this different body response? It's an amazing process. It just switches it over. It puts the lungs in charge. And so what I want to say in the long term with that, I don't need to say saw and ha anymore. I'm so used to the mechanics of it, if you will. I don't like that word, but I can make the switch just because I know how, because my body knows to do that and prefers it that way. Mm -hmm. And it is profound. And it needed to be in touch with how that feels in your lungs and that space that's in your lungs so that when you're talking and you're going back to taking a breath, you can, you can touch into that and feel that space. So Angela, you had your hand up, sorry. No worries, I, I loved where we were with Jude's and then this whole conversation around ha and ha, but I wanted to share what I'm noticing is just a little background in, in the last increasing tension around COVID. I've been not sleeping well. I've been grinding my teeth. I've been holding my jaw really tight. Sure. And this practice has been like lifting the front of my throat. I've had a lot of pain here. And what I'm feeling through this practice is kind of a rebalancing of my neck. Like bringing my tongue up seems to like be supporting the front of my neck. So it's not it's just kind of like... I don't know, almost tripoding feeling mm -hmm, in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's um, it's making me feel like I have some internal strength and space up in here more. So, Great. No, I find about. the same thing. I find it releases the back of my head. I think some of that has to do with the fact that I'm letting the lungs do the work so that I have sinuses back here. So I think the air is moving to the sinuses back there, which is also adding some buoyancy to the, my, to my head. So I think it does all those things. It's my experience as well. I think it is profound, Kate. I know I've done this for years and people just go, whoa, this is really big. Jed. 
So I noticed when I was doing it, um, opening of my throat, kind of thinking about the syllables, but then immediately realizing how I needed to like swallow. And there's this habitual thing that happens where it's hard for me to keep that part of my throat open so much. Um, have you heard of any people experiencing that? Maybe okay. feel like it's related to like nasal drip or something like that too, but it's very habitual. Well, it may be, I mean, I don't know. I've had other people say that when we start doing breathing, they feel tight in their throat. And so I think it's a common thing for people to, you know, and especially, I don't know, you know, if you extrapolate, we know kind of inhibited in our speaking, some, some of us. And so it, it, it's a difficult place to keep open. Mm. So it's worth, it's worth putting in. And I think one of the things that, Megan, you mentioned is like when you're doing the humming and then doing saw with the humming and you're putting vibration in this areas right here, you could actually think about having thinking about making the hum be a little bit more in the throat so that you can kind of in, decrease the density of the throat a little bit. So then when you come back with saw at the end of the hum, you got a whole new perspective of what's maybe happening in the throat. You're increasing the awareness by using sound there. You could even put your hands on there to give more input for sound. When I've tried in the past, to, so kind of addressing the climbing up the hill with the nose breathing, mm -hmm. I've been, I've tried to do the nose breathing and I'm usually about 10% successful, but, I'll try, but I feel like the saha thing may be a piece because it's magic what, how much <laughs> that when I just simply thought those sounds. So I'm excited to try that again um, with, ex with moderate, let's face it, mild exercise. <laughs> no, it's a great point. And make, what's a, where the conversation goes for me about that is, okay, so now you're doing SA. So you've decreased the resistance in your, in your chest to getting more air. So when you're going up the hill, you're not going to try to modulate, modulate your breath to be one thing only. It's going to want to work harder to get more air in because you're putting out more energy. But now you have more flexibility here to get that bigger breath rather than trying to get a breath, which means you're going to pull it and tighten it up. So by doing sa, you'll have more room to get a bigger breath that you need when you're going up the hill. So everybody, you know, no one breath for everything. Every breath changes. Every, there's no two breaths alike. And so sometimes you need more. But what I'm curious about, and I don't want to test this in any way where, forever, but I like what you say, Kate, about I have more space. I'm very curious, and Megan, you can speak to this as a nurse. When people are short of breath with COVID and can't breathe, it would have, for me, it would be, if I can find some more space in my lungs, it may ease some of that shortness of breath. But the only thing that's going to ease that shortness of breath is to find more room in my body to get more air in a place maybe where it's not contracted in that particular place because of the disease. I know I was able to do that once with a bronchitis that I had a really difficult time breathing and I had to find more space elsewhere and it really helped me rest into the bronchitis. That's just my thought. The more space we can find, the maybe the ease in my ease shortness of breath. We're not necessarily wanting to breathe slower when we have shortness of breath because we're really hungry for air, but giving ourselves some more room when we have shortness of breath mm -hmm. may make that easier for us. I don't know. I don't want to test it. Jude. I remember when I took a class like this from you before, you talked about um, if you find yourself, maybe you're going to address this, I'm sorry, but... Um, yeah breathing through your mouth at night. Right. That doesn't happen very often for me, but um, that you could tape your mouth with a paper tape and um, it would remind you not to. And I wondered about that going uphill, if that would be a good idea. Uh, you could. I mean, I have had people, uh, asthmatics time. who I've worked with, who really you know, were major mouth breathers and they just wore the tape 24-7. Mm -hmm. Grocery stores, everywhere they went. And so this is what Jude's talking about, is paper tape. Now we can wear a mask. Yeah, you could wear a mask. It's really odd, and you can have your mouth taped. Yeah, you could. You could. This is paper tape, and the way to wear it is to bend over a piece so it's not sticky. You want a piece that you can grab. Wash your hands. Take up a little bit of the sticky off the back. 
and then wear a smaller piece like this when you sleep to start with. Oh. And you can graduate to this or two pieces, but eventually. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the piece is there so that you, if you get up in the middle of the night, you're coughing, you can get, get it easily and you want to take it off really gently because it can tear your lips and so you have to get older. So, so you can buy these in the, in, in the first aid department at um, Walgreens or CVS or any pharmacy. It usually comes in one inch, this is half inch. But they're $5 a roll or close to it in the pharmacy. These are 39 cents on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Not that I want to give them a business, but it is cheaper. It's quite a bit different. All right, so this is a practice. You want to practice the high, you want to get good at it. You want to be able to access that immediately. So you want to access a couple of things. I just notice I'm walking down the street and I'm feeling anxious and I go, wait a minute. In the old days, I used to think, well, you know, I got what am, you know, what am I anxious about? So all those repetitive thoughts that come up and trying to figure out your life. And if I did this instead of that, maybe I wouldn't be anxious of that. But if I just move my breathing down on my diaphragm, I no longer have that experience of that. So it's just kind of a matter of the habit of breathing. So another thing we can do here is uh, we're going to go back to doing a little Saha breathing this time. But this time I want you to pay attention to a couple of other things. And so I'm going to just going to speak through these even though I'll put this up here. So, in the, so we're gonna to start to breathe, and what I want you to pay attention to, and especially on the ha, and this is another way to really ground yourself, to really feel like you can find some rest in your body when it's very difficult to, and that is your exhale is gonna take you down to gravity. It's gonna, you're gonna be moving towards the earth as you exhale. You're emptying your body of some of its buoyancy. So it's a little heavier because it's not as buoyant. It doesn't have the air. So that heaviness is going to put you more in touch with you, bring your attention there. So that you're coming down to land on the support that you're on. The chair, your feet. So you want to feel on the exhale that you're returning to some support. Support is very important. We all need support. And at the end of the exhale, can you just rest in that support for a moment? And then when you breathe in with sa, you keep an awareness of that support. So you don't leave it. So you breathe with support. And when I say with support, I mean with the awareness of the support. And then the inhale, you're getting a little more buoyant. You're expanding a little bit, coming in a little more relationship to the space inside of you. And you exhale, the space is getting smaller and you're coming back to support. And you keep the awareness of support. You breathe with awareness of support. And this exercise increases the release of tension. The more support you have, in your body from underneath. The more the places that perhaps are being held, you know, I can release a little bit of this tension because I'm being held. Just like you were when you were a baby if you were rocked. And so every time, just worth noticing, when you feel like, wow, I just let my shoulders go, or I let my eyes go, or I let something go, just really notice the quality of the next inhale. Is there more space? Is it easier? Is tension, tension holds breath cap captive. So when we let go of some tension by letting it release to support, we get a little more space so the breath could be bigger next time, at least for one or two times. And you also may notice other places in your body sensations. Just breathe with them. Anything that comes into your awareness, just breathe with it. Very. Um, 
the word I'm looking for, but it's better to breathe with awareness of what you're being aware of rather than trying to breathe into something. Most people don't understand what it means to breathe into something, but if you're aware of something and you breathe with the awareness of it, breath moves with it. And the body moves with breath. So your body is meant to be fully breathable, fully movable with breath. Everything moves when you breathe. And this is a good way to see what your tension patterns are, because every time you do this, you may notice you release tension in the same way in the same place each time. And so you get to learn how to breathe with those tensions and help them soften. As soon as you breathe with them, they're moving again. The sensations are just a way of calling you to them. It's the body intelligence is saying, here, pay attention here. Breathe with me here. Same is true with emotions and feelings. Breathe with them. Give them life by breathing with them so they can move on. So you may find it's what I like about this is when you're aware of the ground at the end of the exhale, your inhale starts right where you left off. You don't come back to your chest or higher up. You breathe right where you left off. way of grounding yourself, a way of finding rest. So if you were lying down, you would notice all the places that your body is touching the earth and receiving support and letting it soften into support like a dog or a cat, completely relaxed into support. Okay, you're coming so close to the end of our time, so I want to bring you back from this. This is stuff you can do on your own. I just wanted to give you a feeling of it. Does anybody want to report in? Just a couple of comments. Kate? So on a personal experience level, I definitely had little twitches of muscles in my neck that have been tight, letting go um, as I was doing the exercise. And... What also came to me is this descending focus is really, really valuable right now from Chinese medicine perspective. We say the lung is responsible for descending and dispersing fluids. And when the lung is overcome by phlegm or too much fluid as in pneumonia, that's a sign that the lung has lost its ability to efficiently descend and disperse the fluids. And so this is a great way either, you know, before or after somebody gets sick, but if we can really strengthen their capacity to descend with exercises like this, it, it makes folks, folks less vulnerable. You know, the less stagnant fluid you've got in your lung that hasn't been descended, the better off you are, whether you get sick or not. And that's also, if you, once you descend and you finish the descent and realize you can just hang out there for a minute, and you, you get the rest you need also in each breath. And then you don't pick it up and go back up high again. You just breathe from down there and the length and stay descending. Thank so anyway, you. I just need to say thank you for that. It's a really valuable thing right now. Yeah, thank you for that piece too. I think so too. I think we can make ourselves less susceptible by keeping our breathing less stressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did notice as I was breathing uh -huh. um, during the meditative conscious Saha breathing just now that I got a lot of fluid in the back of my throat. Mm. Now again, I'm, I'm on the healing um, from COVID-19 right. and what um, was very helpful was to 
focus on breathing with it, you mm -hmm. know, so that it will usually be something that I feel I have to actively do something about, clear my throat, maybe try to cough up or whatever. But in, while we were doing the exercise, I said, okay, I'm going to just release to breathing with it. And it did flow, you know, and didn't feel like I was choking on Great. Um, or anything. So that's going to be very interesting for me going forward in the next several days because each, each day I'm so much better. Just saying. Yeah, the breathing with is so important. It just, it's every, it's every, <laughs> breathing is life. It gives everything its life, whether it's emotion, whether it's a, a feeling, whether it's a sensation in the body. If you want to keep that thing alive, to know more about it, to be more intelligent about what's happening, and you breathe with something. And that's the whole practice for me of breathing. It's like, I want to know my breath. I want to know its behavior. I'm in a relationship with it. I want to have as much intimacy and know how it behaves as much as I can so that I can be in relationship with that behavior and see if it serves me or it doesn't serve me. And so I, so in, in a potato class, people are just, are, invited to practice 60 minutes a day in five minute periods or 10 minute increments just what we're doing here as a way of getting familiar with the breathing as a way of giving your body a chance to return to something that feels more comfortable because when we're not aware of it we go back to our old habits and so we want to become discerning about when we're in our old habits and when we're in a habit that really nurtures us so practicing that you go, oh, whoa, I feel so much better. Oh my God, I don't feel so good right now. Oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm doing the old habit. Let's get back to the other habit. So make the switch real quick. And we want to get better at being able to make that switch in one breath. That's all it takes is one breath. Like I've watched it on my software program with people's CO2 levels. They can make a change in their whole physiology in one breath. Just returning to something that actually allows the breath to be more natural, not manipulated. Yeah, Jennifer. So uh, my son, who's 16, has been very ill for about eight days. Mm. And this, there's a misnomer about COVID not affecting teenagers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it does. And um, he was here, and then he's not feeling well enough, so he went to lay down. But I just wanted to say this exercise for me as his caregiver the last eight days has been so grounding because I don't think I've been able to breathe as his mother, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> worried about what was going to happen for almost eight days. So this is just such a wonderful practice and I thank you for sharing that with us today. I also think this has a real application with our kiddos who are home right now and feeling very unsettled and not knowing what comes next and there are great mental health impacts to our kids right now and I think this could really be a useful tool to share with our educators and with others who are on the front lines working with our kiddos because they haven't been taught the importance of breathing. And I think no, I mean that's been great. It's been very frustrating to me that all the advice out there is no advice about breathing in the general media. Yeah, so thank um, you, this is really helpful. You're welcome, and I wanna give you two more exercises. I wanna give you this one and the next one after that um, that are also really important. This one is really, this is, a, this is also another one of those miracle things. This is called a mini pause. And what happens is what you're speaking to, Jennifer, is like when people are sick and when we're caregiving, we tend to move, everything moves up, we get frightened, we move up into the chest. So after every cough, after every sneeze, after every yawn, after every sighing, every, every exasperation, you want to breathe in, breathe out, and suspend your breathing for three to five seconds. It just brings you right back down again. And if you're not feeling well, if you're starting to not feel well, and you can even do this if you're not feeling well, you can have to do this with your son, do a hundred of them in an hour. And do 100 of them in an hour three times a day if you really feel like you're getting sick. So you breathe in, you breathe out, you hold your breath three to five seconds. Take mm -hmm. a normal breath or two, and then do another one. Just repeat. And if you lose track of 100, get 100 toothpicks. Every time you do one, move a toothpick from the left to the right. It's an, it's, it's a, it's, I can't tell you how important this is for recovery and for prevention. And so a question came up from somebody who's not here. What do I do with a child who gets asthma when they're out work, when they're out playing? This is one thing you can do. Sit them down, quiet them down, have them do a series of mini pauses. Robert. And if, and if you have COVID, you want to be careful. You don't want to hold your breath too long, maybe just three seconds. Robert. You don't want to stretch your body too much. 
I'd like to I'd like to offer something because I work with children and teens. I'm a for many 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 years. Um, in the excesses of the intellect that we can get into by giving lots of instructions to ourselves and to children and teens, very simple, creating visual cues around the house. Cut out a picture that reminds you to breathe. Cut out a picture, draw, sketch, write the word breathe. Write the word breathe on your hand. Um, nose breathe. In, write the word nose breathe. Nose breathe, obviously. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> of course. Put it through, put it on the door as you walk in, as you walk out a door, on the refrigerator. And that helps your children, it helps me as an adult, but it helps your children and your teens not think like, oh wait, I'm supposed to remember this again. I'm supposed to, you know, um, visual cues, visual artistic cues. Great, and if you want some musical cues, there's um, a great video going around right now of a guy, it's a great voice, doing Staying Alive. I don't know if any of you have seen that one. He does a whole disco thing with people from all over the country and it's staying inside, staying inside. And it's a great little piece. So look for it. It's really, he's, he sounds just like the guys who did that song in the first place. The young, young man. It's beautiful. All right. So um, another exercise. Well, this is, we, this is just signs of exposure and um, we know what those are. Um, definitely increase in asthma medications, and you don't have to have symptoms to be a carrier. I just read that it was 11 times more cases than reported. Um, you know, uh, Megan and I talked about this pulse oximeter. I have a reference for it. I thought I put it on there. Um, there was an article about it. It's just one kit, one uh, tool to have in your kit. It's when you have COVID, you do, if you have blockage in your, in your lungs, you're gonna decrease your oxygen saturation. Breath rates are going to increase, and you may see this drop below 95. And if you start seeing a drop, you know you're getting compromised in your lungs, especially if it gets below 90. So just, um, but it's not the first, uh, how do I say it, Megan? It's not the first thing you want to check, but it's one of the things you can use to see that things are staying healthy in your body. And they're under $20 uh, online, and you can get them in also the pharmacy. So just know that over extended periods of time of fear and anxiety really just shred the nervous system. They shred digestion, they shred heart rate, they just shred the immune system. They make the immune system be overactive and just create too much debris and toxin in the body, which makes it much more harder to recover. So just try to do whatever you can to notice your fear and use some of these exercises to balance that. So I wanna go through this one and this one, um, it just depends a little bit whether you're having the asthma or whether you're having anxiety. Or I'm a, I heard another practitioner talk about that if somebody is having COVID and shortness of breath, that hold breath holds for a long period of time are really not a good idea because they're already short of breath. But if this is a good one for anxiety, um, but if you're just having asthma and you don't have an inhaler, this is something you can use. So basically what we're saying here is if you're reading it, and I'm going to walk you through this. We'll do it together. I know we're almost out of time where we are out of time. Um, the, um, you breathe in for two seconds, out for three seconds, and hold for two seconds. So the reason this one was designed this way is that if you see somebody in distress with too much fear, or if they're in an asthma attack, you can help them out of that. Because what this is doing by suspending your breathing is increasing your CO2 levels to increase your oxygenation. And it relaxes the system. So um, and if, you only are, if you're only hyperventilating or feeling anxious, you only do it to the count of six. If you're trying to open airways from an asthma attack, and if you can get up to as high as 10 in the breath holes and then back down, as an asthmatic, I can promise you that it's stressful on the way up, but on the way down, you'll find great relief that your airways are starting to open because the CO2 that's increasing is gonna dilate the airways. So you wanna try this with me? Just 81 seconds, okay? So follow my instructions. I'm going to say breathe in, breathe out, and suspend. We're a little over time, but here, do this one with me. All right, take a breath in. Breath out. Suspend. One, two. Breath in. Breath out. Suspend. One, two, three. Breath in. Breath out. Suspend. One, two, three three, four, breath in, breath out, suspend, one, two, 
three, four, five. Breath in, breath out. Suspend, one, two, three, four, five, six. Breath in, breath out. Suspend, one, two, three, four, five. Breath in, breath out. Suspend, one, two, three, four. Breath in, breath out. Suspend, one, two, three. Breath in, breath out. Suspend, one, two. Breath in, breath out. Okay, real simple. You can do it for somebody else who's, uh, who's feeling anxious or if they're having an asthma attack, you take it up to 10. If you can't get to that higher number, just come back, just don't go as high, but always come back to two. You can only get to seven or you only get to five, fine, come back. These will be in your notes. Everybody okay with that one? Questions? Yeah, Sarah? Hold it, I'll help you. Go ahead. Oop, go ahead. Nope. There you go. Um, is that a good one to um, go to sleep at night or if you wake up at three in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. I do it all the time. Yeah, there's another picture. There's the article um, that's read. When you get the notes, you'll see the article. It's a whole article about how to use a pulse oximeter and how to um, gauge what's going on with you. Okay, so um, nasal wash, you know, you go outside, come back inside, you wash your hands, wash your nose. You can just use either use soap, or you can either use salt in your neti pot or your nasal wash or just put some warm water in your hands and just throw it up in your face and rinse your nose out. Good at, good at any time you're in a polluted area. Um, so this was from Stephen Porges, just you can read this and follow the thing on it. Um, click the link. He's just saying basically, if you're trying to keep in touch with friends, do it through Skype or FaceTime. See each other's faces, not just the text and email, but see each other. Make sure you get it. It'll, it'll help the isolation. I have a, um, a friend in uh, Pittsburgh. Her mother was in a nursing home. His mother, her mother was in a nursing home. Got her out. She was really, she was dying. She was just not surviving. She got home with her two kids. She's not sick at all anymore. Just, uh, you know, she has her kids around her. The isolation was killing her. All right. And so there's some information there about it. And I think everybody now knows N95s. You're not supposed to wear them unless you're sick. Um, the reason they work better is because you can fit them to your face. They have metal bands on there. You don't want anything from the outside. Hard to find, but I think we're getting more of them. Apple just released, I don't know, so many millions they had on stock. I think everybody should have an air filter in the house. I don't think anybody should not have an air filter in the house, given what the, given what the world is like right now. Most type of filters are great, but if you want to lim limit smoke, then you need charcoal. And there was talk online about putting some filters have silver in them, and so silver helps with viruses. If you're an asthmatic and you can't open your windows during smoke, no cooking. Cooking really pollutes the air. I have a I have a mounted monitor in the house, um, like this one, and I can really tell as soon as I start cooking, the air quality just deteriorates immediately. Um, so that's me. Um, I'm doing telehealth. Um, sessions that insurance pays for. So if you want to sign up for that, you can be in touch with me and I'll tell you how to do that. And I also do private sessions right through Skype and Zoom. So just, I don't want to keep you longer than you want, but I'm happy right now to have to con continue the discussion and see if there's anything anybody wants to speak to um, and share. Angela. Hey there. Um this was awesome. Thank you so much for all this. You're welcome. A question I have, I'm talking with a lot of healthcare providers, nurses and such too in my role, and I'm wondering what would be the best technique that might be helpful for them? Do you think that doing the um, mini pause would be best in the hospital setting when they're going between 
patient rooms or do you, what do you think would be a little bit of wisdom that I could share with some of those people? Yeah, really I think the mini pose is a good one to be prepared to, you know, to get, I think what's important, most important for me is consciousness. So if I'm aware of my breathing and staying like, okay, I'm staying quiet in my breathing, I'm staying connected to myself and my breathing, so I am more <laughs> responsive to the moment because I'm conscious and present. So doing a couple of mini pauses, if that's all I have time for in the beginning, just brings my attention to my breathing. Like, oh, okay. Breathe my nose, stay quiet, try to keep myself as grounded as possible, see what's happening here in the moment, be present to the situation, leave the room, restore myself to that, any anxiety that might have built in the time. Yeah, I think that'd be a really good one, actually. And I think the Saha, of course, is just endlessly valuable. Because the more present we are in the experience, the more responsive we are. And the more responsive we are, the more effective we are. And the more effective we are, the more satisfied we are, and the people we work with can be more satisfied. Cool. Thank you. I think, you know, a lot of healthcare providers are riding a big anxiety edge and you know we're doing our best to help people get grounded and keep them able to go back into the fray so and sleep you know the thing with the thing what happens when we get far far away from breathing and feeling its nourishment and feeling like we're connected to ourselves that way the harder it is to sleep and it's one of the reasons that I suggest doing it for five minutes every hour is because if we started it, did it in the morning and then do it, don't do it till 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, it's so much harder to get come back to peace inside of ourselves. So if we're constantly returning to it throughout the day, it's like, oh, a fresh reminder. It's just easier to stay connected over time. I always tell the story, I like telling, I like telling the story of a, a keto master who was 92 years old and he, was, he would always win and his students could never beat him. And they, so they, they get together one day and they say, we're going we're gonna to get him in the middle of the night when he gets up to go to the bathroom because he's 92 years old. So we'll just wait for him in the bathroom and jump him when he gets it. So, you know, he's, he's at the stall, he's doing his business and they come out of the stalls and they jump him and he beats every one of them. And so they say, master, master, how is it you're on center all the time? He says, I'm not on center all the time. I just know how to get there really quickly. And that's what we want here. We want to be able to return to our own breathing and our own nourishing sense of self in one breath. Oh, just make the switch. Because for me, a lot of these, a lot of these diseases, and I'm not say, saying this about COVID-19, but I know this is an asthmatic. It's a very particular frequency. Mm -hmm. It has a very particular breathing pattern to it. And that breathing pattern reinforces the frequency of the, of the, of the dysfunction. So if I can breathe in a way that changes that frequency, I can move out of that. And I've done it over and over and over again. I feel the breath like I every mean, asthmatic does. It's like, oh, this one's not going to be good. If this one keeps on like this, I won't be able to breathe. So I'll make the switch, go back to Saha. Oh, okay. It just changes the frequency. So it's, I think breathing is frequency medicine. Jude? Are you going to be doing more of these? I think so. As long as people That's keep great. coming, I'm going to keep doing them. Um, so I think I'm going to do one again on Wednesday and I'll do again one next Sunday. And I do have one that's supposed to be scheduled on Facebook through the Breathable Body Facebook page next Saturday, I think it's April 4th or maybe Sunday. And that one's free, but I'll keep doing these. I mean, I appreciate that I'm being sort of called to do them now, having all the skill really to share and wanting to get it into more places and more social media. Charlie over there suggested I get into Instagram and other places that um, maybe more people can see it. So I've I'm been I've, I've been going to a free Feldenkrais class once a week that um, by Jeff Haller that um, it's it really combines with this so well. It's yeah. settling into your body, settling in you know the whole thing. It's really good. Yeah, we didn't really talk about it, but you know, a lot of people hold their breath. People feel like they hold their breath. And one of the ways we hold our breath is not just by not breathing, but by keeping our bodies tense. It, he holds the breath in a small space. And when it's in a small space like that, it's hard for it to be nourishing. Right. Eliminating its potential. So thanks, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for this. Yeah. You're welcome. My pleasure, really. You waving goodbye, Angela. <laughs> Yeah, good to see you. We got to go. Yeah, me too. Me too. Thanks for coming, everybody.
Uh, a little later today, you'll get an email with, um, and I'll try to answer this question, questions here, if there's one here I can answer, um, um, with, with the slides and the links for uh, YouTube, and there'll be a link for the Google Drive, which will have the chat and also the slides in them also, but I'll also attach the slides to, the, uh, to your email. I was wondering about the name of, well, the, the woman has COVID, is recovering from it, right? Yeah, uh-huh, Devorah. I, okay, it doesn't show her name. No, it shows it as a race. Sometimes. Right, and I just... I what do you want to know? Well, she wants to talk. Let's listen to her. Oh, okay, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. I got yeah. my camera's in the way. Oh, I'm saying goodbye, I'm saying goodbye. I'm fine, that's my name, everyone. Good to meet everybody. Yeah, likewise. Yes, it'd be Thanks nice to hear Robert. more from you because I don't know anyone who has it, and it's nice to hear about how how to protect yourself more. Yeah. So, if any, think, question, if any questions come up or any, please write. Okay. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bye. bye. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Say bye. Bye bye. Bye-bye.